Welcome to Getting Your Money's Worth, the show that focuses on value. I'm Judith West, and our guest today is Evie Hansopoulos. Evie Hansopoulos. Evie, Evie, I know, Evie. it's a tough so one. So how about I got the Hansopoulos right, but not Very the first name right. I was so good. So it was Evie. Evie. Evie, Evie. okay, yes. all right. It's Evie. been happening all my life, don't worry uh -huh. about it. Well, okay. Uh, anyway, I'm saying Miss Hansopoulos. Yes. Right. Globe, um, Executive Director of Global Kids. All right, now that we got that out of the way, um, tell me, um, give us a little background of um, Global Kids. Sure. Well, Global Kids is an educational nonprofit. We're based here in New York City, although we have expanded recently to Washington, D.C. And we've been around for over 21 years, and our mission is really to prepare young people, particularly young people from underserved communities, um, to become global citizens and community leaders. What do you mean by global citizens? A global citizen is really someone who is not only thinking about their life and their world um, and their issues in their own immediate neighborhood or city or state or even country, but is also thinking about the interconnectedness that we, that we experience as human beings on this earth. So they're understanding not only what's happening in their own community, but they're also understanding what's happening in other countries, what's happening in other parts of the world, and how these forces shape what's going yeah. on here in their own communities as you well. You know, um, this morning there was an article in the uh, New York Times mm -hmm. written by Sandra Day O'Connor, who is director of, I don't remember the, the, uh, the organization, mm -hmm. and lamenting the fact how little students knew about their own country. That's right. That's true. Uh, um, I don't, I forgot what the, I forgot what the uh, statistics were, but they were, embarrassingly low for something like, why do we have the Bills of, Bill of Rights? Right. Students were not able to identify yeah. the Bill of Rights, um, uh, powers of Congress. Right. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, checks and balance system mm -hmm. in our government, which is the basis of our Congress. and uh, So um, it's a bit of a stretch, isn't it, to expect kids to relate to other parts of the, the, of the planet Earth when they don't know anything about their own backyard? Well, we've actually found it to be different. Um, we actually have found that when young people are exposed and do understand issues going on in other parts of the world, they're better, to un better able to understand what's happening here and understand oh. how change and how progress is made in this country. So, for so example... So a global yeah. perspective yes. is a better backyard perspective. That's what we feel, because when you learn about challenges that other countries are facing, other people are facing, um, what's happening in the world, understanding global economics, understanding global health issues, um, understanding poverty in other countries, you're better able to connect it with what you see happening in your own community and better understand how to address it because you have a broadened worldview. And certainly for many uh, kids that um, are, are uh, of the suburban, and suburban are, are of the uh, Ivy League mm -hmm. uh, uh, direction, might uh, find reason to stop whining about their life and appreciating all they have. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, you know when you do learn, learn about what's happening in the old in the in, in other parts of the world. I mean, you do better understand and appreciate what you have here, and you also see how you can better address some of the injustices that we face here in this country as well. And you see the interconnectedness. So, I mean, when Global Kids got started, uh, it was started by my predecessor, Carol Artajani. I've been the executive director since September, but she was the founding executive director, amazing woman who was very visionary, and over 21 years ago understood how important it was for young people to um, learn about the world and also how young people had assets within themselves and how these assets could be something that could help shape and improve our society here. And perhaps, I would suppose I could say too, uh, bringing out those assets uh, could very well lead to better in, to more involvement in our own uh, government process here, an electoral process here in, in, the, in our own country. For sure. And right. I think that's one of the um, key goals of Global Kids, is to have a more engaged and effective citizenry. And to get young people, to get people here in New York City or in D.C. or wherever Where we're, we're working, excited. to participate more in government, to understand um, how to shape policy and not just be the recipient of policy, but how to be actively engaged, the importance of voting. Those are all core values of global kids that tie into what it means to be a global citizen. Right. You have to be an effective citizen at home in order to be an effective global citizen. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. But so let's move on, though. Um, um, we, I read about you uh, in, in a letter to the editor of the New York Times mm -hmm. where you responded to um, a documentary 
was that, what was the name of the documentary? Not Race to the Top. Um, I think it was a, 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 an uh, evaluation, a research, a research by, study that had was, been done. It had been done mm -hmm. um, by Harvard, which uh, surveyed how kids felt about their teachers. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and there was a conclusion that the more um, effective the student thought the teacher to be, the more learning the, the student had, in fact, achieved, mm -hmm. according to that student's responses. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was back and forth discussion about that. And it's all part of this larger picture of how do we evaluate teachers mm -hmm. and teachers' performance. And your comments were that, oh, let's go for this. Uh, I don't want to, you say that this, as a matter of fact, to quote you, you say that, um, um, after all, um, as adolescents, weren't we all able to s separate inspiring teachers from ineffective and boring ones? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Sure. Um, are adolescents able to judge teachers' abilities? I think overall they are. And this is what I'm saying is that young people have assets that sometimes are overlooked. And so when you're looking at all the changes that are happening in education, whether it's talking about um, teacher effectiveness, or whether it's talk, talking about how to um, improve standards, how to engage students in learning, young people really aren't being asked, well, what do you think? And I feel like that's a missed opportunity because in this, in this study, I think it was done by the, the Gates Foundation, they, there, was a, right. there was a, a correlation uh, between how students rated their teachers and how well that they did in school or on tests. I think it had to do with testing, so they were tying it into that. But basically they were saying that the students who said, I feel that this teacher is excellent. They noticed that that teacher generally had students who were performing better. And so I feel like young people, for the most part, know what makes for a good teacher. Um, just like I feel that young people know what makes for an engaging learning environment or actually have really important ideas and opinions on how to reform how, education, how and they're would, not being asked. How, how would you implement that on a broad base? I mean, I don't think it's done in a way where, because, you know, there's always going to be some students who, you know, might have a gripe against a teacher that's wow. unfair. And, and But I do think overall, if it's done in a way that um, is not seen as either threatening to the teacher or undermining the teacher, because teachers would appreciate feedback. Um, but I, I also feel that students would be honest and thoughtful if it's framed in the right way. Okay. You know, we have a problem in education today. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I think this, this document we're talking about um, spoke also of overstressed, overachieving, overworked, overpressured kids. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a problem today in, in this country of education, and it's primarily about folks that think that kids, in, certainly in urban settings, aren't overpressured, aren't overachievers, aren't over, uh, overworked. As a matter of fact, it may even be that the reverse is true, say, many education reformers. How do you correlate, I mean, how do you correlate this business of getting students' ideas across all um, uh, kinds of students, both urban and suburban? I think it's important to have them at the table. You know, when these discussions are going on, it's often adults who are talking about it, making the recommendations. But I think actually having active youth engagement where they're having the opportunity, whether it's in their school to meet with their principal, whether it's at the Department of Education and meeting with the chancellor or the deputy chancellors, the voices of young people are very, very important. And I do find that most young people will be thoughtful. They want to be challenged. They may not be being challenged. In, do you, as you folks go in and do this? I for sure. To I mean, you, but tell me how you do it. Well, we go, Global Kids works in schools. We run programs um, in the classroom with teachers, but also after school programs that develop the leadership skills, global competency, um, and um, really help young people realize their potential. And we're, we're usually working with students who are working in communities that may be underserved. Maybe the schools have been identified as being low performing. But certainly, there's a lot of good things going on in those schools. And there's certainly a lot of great students. And so people may feel like, OK, these students aren't performing. They're, you know, they're not overstressed. They're not performing enough. But there's still a lot of pressure in schools for students to do well on these tests. And in a way, the tests aren't the way to kind of increase student engagement. In fact, if, if anything, and I realize the importance of, of testing, you have to have some measure yes, or benchmark. Yeah. But when it's so high stakes and when it's the only way that you're evaluating whether a young person is learning, it's going to affect what a teacher is able to do in the classroom. It's going to affect the learning environment. It's going to affect um, whether or not young people feel that they can connect to what it is that they're learning. Because if it's all for a test, 
where are you having these dialogues, these discussions, these going into depth? You know, that's that's kind of what's missing. So I think you, more of that needs to happen. Right, and uh, you and you do this to a certain extent when you go into schools. Do you? Uh, but how? I I think the, the 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 issue here is how does that get translated into teacher performance mm -hmm. on any kind of a broad-based scale. Well, we're not there to... And that may not be your role. Yeah, our role, I mean, I feel like teachers are extremely hardworking. I feel like um, they're underappreciated. You know, I have two teachers in my family, and I know how hard they work, and they're very smart. And I know that teachers are facing tremendous challenges. Um, so, you know, granted, not every... Not everyone out there is great, but overwhelmingly, I feel like, I mean, think of the teachers that you may have had growing up. I would imagine that most, most, of, but most of them are, are, are wonderful, you know, and really, and I know for me, my experience has been fantastic. In terms of how does it translate to teacher quality, um, I feel that the more um, opportunities teachers have to be creative with their teaching, um, the more chance they have to, you know, t take a look at civics, right? Civics is kind of being cut out in terms of what's being I, taught. We just spoke of that earlier. We just talked about right. it, right? So, and when you're only kind of, uh, when you're being pressured to focus on one area, um, it can limit how you develop a child holistically and really are getting them to think about what it means to be um, a young person in this world. You know, you're not just um, a learner, you're a citizen, you know, you're a peer, you're, you can be a role model for other young people. I mean, what we're trying to do is just provide a space for young people to develop in themselves yeah. things that they may not be able to do during the course of the regular school day. Well, I suppose, listen, it goes back to the old, the, the old style. I mean, you, you, a classroom teacher sitting down with a group of kids and even having an, old, a, an informal survey. Mm -hmm. Sure. You mean to yeah, get feedback yeah, on yeah. the course and things yeah, like I, that, and yeah, I think that there's some teachers who would and welcome I think there that. Are, I think that there are lots of teachers that would welcome that For because, sure. as you say, testing itself, it's. May, it may, if it's not interesting for the kids, it probably isn't that interesting for the teacher either. Yeah. But uh, we come back to the same thing. What, where, what is the litmus test? What's mm -hmm. the benchmark going to be to judge how effective a teacher is on a, some kind of a national scale mm -hmm. without asking the teachers? But um, you guys are doing it in your own s small space and successfully. Well, what we're trying to do is make sure how that do the you voices make sure your own, you got your our own, own success. success. Um, our own success, we look at whether or not our young people are staying in school and graduating because we are working with, um, you know, mostly an at-risk population. They're at risk due to attendance issues or other challenges that they may face. So we're we're trying to make sure that they stay in school so that they graduate. Well, that certainly is a that certainly is a scientific formula. Sure. Yeah, and and we have had great success with that in terms of really helping to address some of the obstacles that young people face and make learning fun and engaging and also connect them to the world outside their own community and give them kind of different kinds of experiences that they may have during the school day. We're also looking at how many go on to higher education. We feel that that's really important. Many of the students that we work with, they're first generation. They might be immigrants themselves. They might be their first family member to go to but college. You serve, you, you, you serve as a motivating force. Yes, and, and also providing them with some of the guidance that they may need to make it to that next yeah, step. Okay. For well, sure. I think that that's a good way to end because yeah. that's really what we're, what we're talking about. Right. Um, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, you. Shed, you shed light into, uh, I think, something that we all think about all the time. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. all want our I mean, young people want, to learn, right? We all want our young people to learn. There's we all want our young people. It. We all young, want our young people to be successful. Right. I think that goes across any partisanship. For sure. Right. So thanks very much for being on the show. Uh, I appreciate what your group does, and we have to keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Judith West. You're watching Getting Your Money's Worth, and our guest was the executive director, right, of, of Global Kids. Thanks for watching.